Uh, good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Nathan Hill for inviting me here. Uh, in this talk, I will be offering an overview of the contribution that medieval data makes to the reconstruction of Proto-Basque. And the presentation is going to be divided in, in four sections. I first offer a brief introduction to the history of Basque etymological studies. Then in section two, I will describe an uh, uh, what we understand by medieval uh, data in Basque, in Basque studies and what kind of corpus we, we have. Section three uh, addresses uh, the relevant data and discussion of, of this talk. I will present a list of reconstructed words and morphs and show that recently discovered medieval data actually prove that reconstructed forms were, were right. And finally, if I have time, uh, I will make an assessment of Blevins' uh, reconstructive proposals. So when we look at the history of modern Basque studies, Michelena's name is the unavoidable name, uh, we can talk about an, uh, a, an era <coughs> before uh, Michelena's works, especially uh, his Basque historical uh, phonology, phonetics, sorry, in 1961, and after them. Yeah. As you can see in this pre-Michelena era, we have mostly uh, foreign scholars who came from other areas of expertise. Um, the interest of uh, and goals of this etym of this pre-Michelena uh, etymologists were the following: as you can see, you, they were looking for genetically related languages. Uh, in the case, well, they would compare Basque to Caucasian and all those uh, theories. Uh, in the case of uh, Rolfs, Romanists like uh, Rolfs, uh, they would try to analyze to what extent the original uh, Basque culture was affected by. Latino Romans uh, languages and, and culture, as you can see, there was no, there was no real interest. Can you see that? There was no real interest in reconstructing uh, a proto language. Instead, Michelena and later the scholars around him uh, applied themselves to to more methodological, um, met methodologically standard tasks. They would or he would, uh, Michelina would claim the importance of philological work as a basis for any kind of uh, diachronic reconstruction. And in this, in this view, uh, uh, in this view, etymological ha etymologies happen to be a natural outcome of the philological and linguistic work, not uh, an outcome per se. So one of the latest results of academic Basque studies is the publication of the Historical Etymological Dictionary of Basque, which is about to be published uh, in a month or two. Uh, in this uh, dictionary, following Antoine Meillet's classical uh, motto, uh, well, reconstruction has to be based on both theoretical accuracy as well as on solid uh, philological grounds. And uh, we think this uh, dictionary is a good example of the of the second part of, of his motto, uh, since we have extensively and systematically browsed medieval documents, which is what we are going to talk today. So after this brief introduction to the history of Basque etymological works, I will go on with uh, uh, the with, uh, next section. In this section, I will make uh, two main questions. Uh, first, uh, what do Basque medieval data look like? I will offer you some examples so you, you can see what we are dealing with. And uh, then uh, I will offer a list of the kinds of linguistic or philological insights that this data, this medieval data offer to us. So I brought here a couple of pictures of a very important cartulary. Yes, yeah, so you can see what kind of documents they are. And this is a page of this cartulary which uh, exemplifies clearly the nature of most medieval data. They are written in they are written in, in Latin or Romans and then uh, and then you have Basque pla place names or person names. So these are these are names. Basque 
names. The corpus I've been using for my, for my dissertation for, for the dictionary uh, consists of more than 300 uh, medieval cartularies and collection of collections of diplomatic documents. Uh, in these cartularies, as I have said, we have for the most part place names, but we can also found a couple of sentences, uh, a list of words by a pilgrim, and uh, later in the late Middle Ages, very brief excerpts of letters and list of words, etc. <coughs> So what do these place and person names look like? I have gathered a few examples in order to show what kind of linguistic evidence uh, they offer. This one, we have uh, the beautiful field and place name beautiful field. Uh, field. So we have a, an adjectival noun and phrase. In this one, uh, this one is a similar one, but in this case we have a postpositional phrase uh, with uh, gabe, with a postposition gabe, which uh, in which uh, Putsu on Bagavia would stand for the bottomless pit or well. And we all also have uh, things like uh, a number of phrases such as Belerazzo y Torieta, meaning the nine fountains. Okay. I also brought some person names. In this case we have Uxortua, which is the Latin for which is Latin that stands for your wife. Emasteona, uh, which is uh, readily analyzed as the good wife. Uh, we have things like Don Garcia Apestegico, with uh, Apestegui meaning priest place, and co is uh, 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 the relational uh, position. That would mean Don Garcia from the priest house. And then we have uh, some funny and interesting. Uh, uh, names such as Pero Peris Garidario, in which Pero Peris would uh, with the Romans counterpart for Peter, son of Peter. And then uh, we have uh, a nickname, which is Garidario, and uh, where Gari is uh, an object incorporated to an to, to inflected verb, meaning uh, uh, which encodes third person dative. So that would be something like uh, Peter, son of Peter, the one to whom wheat flows, or something like that. We guess it was uh, a rich guy. So even though we have only place names, we uh, we also are able to find, uh, uh, I won't say complete sentences, but at least we have inflected verbs and things like that. This is not the only example. So what kind uh, of insight do this uh, medieval data and secondary sources offer? Well, they uh, offer us the early statistations of some words of the Basque lexicon. We also uh, have been able to recover some variants that were not previously attested. They also offer us a more accurate picture of the historical distribution of dialectal variants. And finally, and most interestingly, at least for the purpose of this talk, they also offer positive proof of previously reconstructed forms. So, as for the earliest attestation, I have organized in the table uh, uh, those words and those words uh, first attestation, Abar, Ate, Bosch, and Chirta, Branch, Door, Five, and Piece of Iron. Uh, in the, the Basque Journal Dictionary, which is the one we are using up to now, we have those first attestation data. And for example, in the, in the case of branch, we take, the, for example, back at least like uh, 600 years and, and so on. Yeah. So that's one of, of, uh, of the good things that has looking at medieval data. Um, I have also found previously unknown variants of several words. Like for Butsu, you have uh, a variant Butsu, which uh, will prove crucial for some uh, reconstruction uh, problems. For Garai, we have things like Garain and Garahi. For Ibai, I found Ibahi and Ibain, and there's also Ubani. For Sustrai root, there's Sustai and Sursai, which are all up to now unknown variants of those words. 
So we also uh, have a more accurate picture of the historical distribution of dialectal variants, as exemplified by the word nine. We have the the the, the variant Bederatsu, uh, which up to now it was only attested in Eastern dialects, uh, against uh, the, the the form that that has been uh, accepted for standard Basque, which is Bederatsi. And now we have uh, also uh, we have also uh, the Bederatsu variant in a central area, very far in Basque terms uh, of its actual modern area in Eastern Basque. And most importantly, as I said, we have found uh, proof of previously, of, of previously reconstructed forms. So the discuss discussion of these forms will conform the, the third part, the third section of this, of, of this presentation. I have gathered examples both from reconstruction of the lexicon on the one side with a discussion regarding words like askar, uh, big, strong, evaki, to cut, to cut, uh, butsu, putsu, and on the other side, I have, I have also brought here a couple of examples of regarding the reconstruction of the nominal, uh, of the definite declension, yeah. of, uh, more specifically the reconstruction of uh, the locative phrases singular and, and, and plural. So let's start with a discussion regarding Ascar. There we have uh, what Michelina reconstructed. He reconstructed the word uh, as, as a derived word from asi to grow with a suffix kor, uh, which uh, has a general meaning of uh, that denotes tendency. And uh, this word also has the meaning maple tree. And Oh, well, for the identity between the, the, the adjective and the, and the, and the tree name, uh, you can just recall Latin robur uh, and, and robustus. So what do we find in medieval documents? Uh, first of all, we have uh, the, the modern place name Ascarraga, which is a modern, quite common uh, place name, uh, name in, in the Basque Country, as well as a, as a last name, which means maple tree place. And the oldest attestation I found for that name is, is Ascorra. Yeah. So that perfectly fits uh, what Michelena uh, reconstructed. So Michelena reconstructed Ascor, and we have medieval Ascor. So uh, in a very important article about the non-finite verb forms, Trask identifies the suffix key in several verbs. And this leads him to reconstruct modern ebaki to cut as, as eban. Yeah. We have eban, and then uh, we have a valence increasing suffix, which is added to the, to the uh, original root. Again, what do medieval uh, data tell us about this verb? So we have, in modern Basque, we have the word for, for, for trench, which is a compound name, lubaki. And which uh, etymologically means uh, the ground that is cut. Yeah. And we have the medieval attestation in that uh, Romans sentence. We have uh, a Basque word inserted there. Mandaba facer luevanos para calce del agua, which means uh, he ordered to, to, to make uh, trenches for, for carrying water. So there we have another uh, nice example of how a reconstructed word has actually been found in medieval. The, uh, medieval documents. You have Trask, Evan, and we have medieval Evan. And this, uh, the case of Evan Evaki is indeed a very good example of how Blevins approach fails in different aspects of the discussion. This approach fails in the basic analysis of the word and it also fails in the general account of, of Basque data. She takes for granted that uh, the suffix geeky is part of the root and traces this alleged root back to the pre-proto-Basque Indo-European. This makes no sense since the addition of, of uh, the suffix, as we can see, is quite recent. Yeah. So what's the problem with the reconstruction of, of Gascon puts? Well, well, this case uh, uh, and its medieval va variant, and the, the case of Basque puts and, and its medieval variant Buitsu takes us beyond the domain of, of Basque diachronic linguistics. In this case, Basque medieval data proved to be crucial for the reconstruction of, of Proto-Roman forms. Um, there is a problem described in Romanistic, uh, um, well, 
uh, as described by, by, by Fouché, the French Romanist Fouché, he asks uh, he ask, he to himself how comes that the regular O didn't change, uh, the regular change uh, from O to O didn't um, uh, take place in Gascon. So Fouché uh, needs, uh, sorry, so, yeah, sorry. So Fouché needs a, a variant in Southern Romans, uh, which for him is Gascon, uh, in which there is an E vowel in the first syllable that would prevent that change to happen. So the problem is, as he himself acknowledges, that there's no trace of that vowel in Gascon. Okay. And he asks that, he asks that cette analyse est sûre que dans cette région il n'y ait pas eu anciennement de i au contact avec lui un accentué latin. So the contribution uh, of Bas medieval data again proves crucial for, for solving this problem. Since there is a variant of Basque word putso which fits exactly what Fouché needed for, for Gascon, for the proto Gascon form. So the E necessary for the Romans protoform is not attested in Gascon, but is attested in, in Basque. So, so far these were the examples uh, regarding the reconstruction lexicon. I will now turn to nominal morphology, uh, to two examples of the reconstruction of the definite declension. I have summarized here the discussion on the, uh, of the locative singular, as you can see, according to, to Jacobsen in 1977, uh, a definite phrase such as echean at home in the house, uh, uh, he would reconstruct a lost consonant, which he thought uh, it was uh, uh, a voiced, a voiced uh, stop. Uh, and the, the, the problem is that uh, if we accept that uh, a is not an article, uh, but the remnant of the animacy marker, which in Basque is ga which uh, doesn't fit very well with what we know about, uh, about those phrases, since they are uh, uh, definite. Yep. So in 2006, I, I offered an alternative explanation for, for, the, uh, for the lost of the, that consonant, for the lost uh, consonant, sorry. And uh, based on a very traditional view, I simply reconstructed an aspiration, which is the initial consonant of all Basque uh, demonstratives. So this, this way we simply say that the definite article is a uh, is also also in locative phrases, not the remnant of the of that uh, um, animacy marker, but uh, it's simply it is simply a, a demonstrative uh, a demonstrative. So we are simply dealing with the grammaticalization of a demonstrative phrase into a definite phrase. Now again, we have some nice data coming from secondary sources in which the locative singular phrase shows to the last consonant. Uh, the, the model form for, for a phrase such as neurean in mind uh, is, as you can see, it, neurean. Uh, and we recently found uh, an attestation from a secondary source which actually keeps the, the original, what we, we had reconstructed as the original uh, Pro, uh, form of, of the locative definite phrases. So again, what we had reconstructed uh, appears in secondary data. So the case, now I turn to, to the case of uh, plural locative phrases, which is kind of similar to, to, to the previous one. Uh, according to, to, to Schuhart, uh, in phrases such, such as uh, echetan, in the houses, the eta, uh, in the plural local cases, is of Latin origin, so it's the, the collective suffix etumeta, which uh, somehow entered the, the Basque, the Basque uh, declension, definite declension system. But again, following uh, a fairly traditional view of the grammaticalization of, the grammaticalization, uh, of demonstratives into articles, I proposed uh, that uh, uh, in definite phrases such as echetan in the houses, we simply have uh, a grammaticalized demonstratives. Uh, we don't have any kind of foreign uh, uh, affix there. So it's again a case of grammaticalization of, uh, grammaticalization of a demonstrative phrase into a definite phrase. And again, uh, we find support for this uh, reconstruction in, in medieval data. So in the place, Names such as Erroheta, which would mean something like uh, the roots, it's a place name, 
uh, we would find uh, the, the original aspiration, which was, which is what what we reconstructed. So, summarizing, I have shown a series of examples in which reconstructive work has proven to be correct, thanks to recently discovered medieval data. For Ascar, uh, we have the reconstructed, the, the reconstructed form Ascor, which is the one that we actually found in medieval records. For Eban, uh, we, for Ebaki, sorry, we, we had trust reconstructed uh, uh, a simple, uh, a more simple form Ebak, Eban, which is the one that we actually found in medieval data, and, and so on and so on. So, well, now if, even though it's, it's not the specific aim of my talk, I'd like to offer a brief typology of the mistakes of a recent, of a recent reconstruction of, of proposal of Proto-Basque. So the author shows a complete lack of philological knowledge. Uh, the author, well, <coughs> takes back to pre-Proto-Indo-European Basque words that only exist in the mind of some modern lexicographers, uh, and the author also takes back to pre-Proto-Indo-European words that are well-known neologisms. Uh, there are also clear long words from Gascon or, 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 or Spanish that are treated as if they belong to the inherited lexicon, such as usta, sango, muri, which are clear. Usta is from Gascon, sango is most probably for from Spanish and so on. So there, there are wrong analysis of compound words such as landelge and ospe. In delge, the author uh, miscuts the word reconstructing delge, which makes no sense once we know that uh, there we are dealing with landa, which is uh, ultimately, we think, a Germanic uh, word, and elge. For ospe, uh, fame, uh, we clearly uh, have a compound norm, uh, a, a, compa a compound noun, which clearly divides between two, uh, with w between a, a morpheme and a lexeme, ochan and, and, and pe. Uh, we have uh, recurrent uh, concept, a recurrent wrong concept conception of Basque morphology, such as such as the previous case I showed you with uh, Ebaki and uh, this case with the uh, locative and, which is taken all together as if it were uh, a, a, a locative, a locative uh, suffix. Uh, for me, the, the, more, the worst part of this approach is that uh, from, a, well, from a more theoretical point of view, there's, uh, there's no attempt to, to answer any of the questions that have been described in the, in the field for for years. So from the point of view of a Basqueologist, this is a huge step back in what has been achieved in, in the field during the, the century. So we come back to the to the to the initial uh, to the initial uh, discussion in which uh, we were looking for genetically related languages but not actually trying to answer uh, problems that have been described in, in Basque linguistics. And I would like to to finish with a methodological reminder, a reminder of what we are doing here when we are doing historical linguistics, which is very nicely put by Thomason. We'll just read it. To be useful to a historical linguist, a hypothesis of genetic relationship must be fruitful. A valid genetic grouping will permit reconstruction and thus lead to a better understanding of the member languages and their histories. If a genetic hypothesis does not lead to new insights of these kinds, which in my opinion is the case, uh, therein, it's sterile and within linguistics, useless. That's all. You have the references there. And that's all. Thanks.